Are books dead? Does anyone read anymore? Well, stay tuned. Ahead, I'll talk with Michael Castleman about the untold story of books, a writer's history of book publishing. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Michael Castleman is the author of 19 previous books, selling over 2.5 million copies. He joins us to talk about The Untold Story of Books, a writer's history of book publishing. Michael, welcome to Some Books Considered. Well, thanks for having me on. Well, this book is filled with fascinating information about books and the book publishing industry. And before we get into some of those interesting facts, give us an overview of this book and and how it's organized. Uh, Well, The Untold Story of Books tells the 600-year saga of book publishing, uh, but from an author's point of view. Most histories of publishing are memoirs by famous publishers, uh, editors, or authors, or they are academic uh, treatises on various aspects of the business. And there's never been a sort of broad, sweeping, easy to read book that focuses on how publishing has impacted authors over 600 years. And the impact has been substantial and not very happy for the overwhelming majority of authors. And so I try to... um, uh, I sifted the history of publishing to uh, base, tell it like it is, as far as authors are concerned. And some people have said to me, oh, Mike, it's so depressing what's happened to authors. And yeah, it's distressing, but what's really depressing is ignorance. If you don't know the world you're operating in, you just can't operate effectively. So I felt like it was a good idea to tell it like it is and talk about what um publishing has been like for authors throughout the history of publishing. From the time of handwritten books to the time of digital books, the cost of distributing a book, it's just dropped dramatically. Right. They and just, that's, that's had big repercussions, but tell us about that. The history of publishing is the story of fewer people producing more copies of more books faster and cheaper per copy. So, um, Gutenberg Bibles uh, retailed um, for today's equivalent of about four or five thousand dollars. But as presses speeded up, the cost of books came down. And so Benjamin Franklin, 250 years after Gutenberg, used a souped up Gutenberg press and he published books for about six hundred dollars. In the 1870s, publishing industrialized and the price of books, and it was easier to produce books, and the price came down to about $75 per copy, which put books within the range of the upper middle class, whereas before they had been items only for the rich. And as industrial printing uh, speeded up the process, uh, by the late 20th century, a typical hardback book was down to $25. And then came digital publishing, which is really cheap. And today, one person sitting in a little room can publish an infinite number of e-books in about an hour for about $100 and distribute them worldwide for free. And so the prices come down even more. And if you look at e-books on Amazon, a lot of them sell for less than a dollar. So the good part of that is that as books have become cheaper, they've become more accessible to more people who could read more and dream about writing books themselves. But the downside for authors is that as books have become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, it's more and more difficult to sell them and get any money at all. And so today, uh, books are easier to publish than they've ever been, but harder than ever to sell. One interesting point you make is that In some ways, we've come full circle. From the very beginning, people essentially were paying to get their books out there. They were self-published, as we would call them today. And now we've come back to that with uh, digital media and all that. It's very easy for someone to self-publish. That's right. Uh, uh, Initially, uh, from Gutenberg to 1900, there were no publishers. There were printers. 
and printers were happy to print what authors paid them to print. And so authors paid publishers to print their books. And I'm talking about every famous author in America you've ever heard of. I mean, you know, James Fenimore Cooper, Walt Whitman, Louisa May Alcott, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, all of them paid to publish. They, in today's parlance, they self-published. But um, that changed in in the late 19th century when uh, publishing industrialized and industrial presses could print so many books so quickly that a new breed of publishers started paying authors for manuscripts. And uh, that's the model we had in the 20th century, uh, which is now called traditional publishing, but it's actually just an 80-year aberration from self-publishing. Starting in around 2000, with digital publishing, uh, authors again could pay to publish. And uh, using self-publishing platforms or hybrid uh, pay to publish outfits. So today, um, some authors still get advances, about 10,000 a year uh, of authors get uh, advances out of 2 million authors who publish every year. But the vast majority of authors, like 99% uh, today, uh, pay to publish just like they did before 1900. Most people probably aren't aware of all the people that are involved with uh, getting a book published, at least in that traditional sense. You, you have the author, you have uh, an agent probably that's representing you to push uh, the book to publishers, you have editors, all sorts of people involved. So tell us a little bit about sort of the industry here and um, how that impacts you as an author. The, uh, well, it takes a village to publish a book. And um, a lot of, uh, today with digital and uh, so much self-publishing, a lot of publishers say, oh, that self-published stuff is trash. No, no, uh, plenty of self-published books are very good. What counts is not how books are published, but usually how they're edited. And so I urge authors to get their manuscripts edited extensively. The Untold Story of Books I hired three editors over various stages of it, uh, and I paid them $2,500 each to go through that book with a fine-tooth comb. And then beyond that, I had 50 friends read the thing. So really, um, if you uh, want to be an author, uh, yes, you're going to spend a lot of time alone in a little room staring at a computer screen. But you need a lot of other people, particularly editors. And beyond editors, of course, if you want to go the um, big five publishing route, you need an agent. And hopefully you find a publisher. Um, And once a book comes out, then there's an army of book publicists who are ready to uh, maybe help, maybe not. Uh, So it really is a much larger enterprise than the lone artist uh, working out ideas on the page. Uh, publishing is an industry, and and we're all kind of cogs and wheels in it. I'm talking with Michael Castleman about the untold story of books, a writer's history of book publishing, and our conversation continues. If you appreciate this discussion, please take a moment to subscribe and hit the like button. And thank you. One of the things I think is a challenge, obviously, for publishers is they want to publish a book they think is going to do well, they, you know, hope it'll become a bestseller, but you just never know, you know, and you, you talk about that in your book. There's not really a secret, secret formula that if you follow it, you're going to have a bestseller. Correct. If there were a formula, everyone would use that formula, but there is no formula. There's a tremendous amount of chance and, and magic in what becomes popular, and there's no way to predict it. And so uh, publishers sign up a list for the coming year, and they honestly hope that every single one of those books will do well. But they know that that's not true. And so as the books wend their way through the um, machinery of coming into print and getting reactions, publishers can tell the difference between books that are getting a lot of action and books that aren't. And so they put everything, all the publicity machinery behind the books that look like they're going to sell. It's very much like farmers planting carrots. When a farmer plants carrots, you hope every carrot's going to be big, fat, and juicy. But as they start to sprout, you start thinning the carrots 
to take out their runts, to allow the ones that look vigorous, allow them room to grow. And uh, publishers do the same thing. If, if a book looks like it's going to tank, they don't promote it. They put all the energy behind what they think is going to sell. And that's just common sense in business. One of the things you talk about in the book are the many challenges that books have faced and some that may people not even think about, but things like uh, radio and television and movies, because they all compete for our time. Yes. Um, it's amazing how often people have predicted the death of books. Um, when, um, when radio and, tel and movies were um, introduced in, in around 1900, um, the pundit said, oh, my God, books are dead. They can't compete. When Edison introduced the phonograph, oh, my God, people are just going to listen to records no one's going to read. And uh, in um, the 1950s, when my generation was young children, television came in and there were lots of predictions. Oh, my God, our, our kids, they're not going to read. Their books are finished. Every time a new communications medium has been introduced, um, pundits have predicted the imminent demise of books. And every single time they've been wrong. Every single time books have not only competed well against new media, they have thrived. And so it's ironic that um, the people who, who say they revere books the most seem to have the least faith in books and reading. I'm betting on books. Nothing is going to kill reading in books. Books are remarkably resilient. And, um, and I think that's a good bet for the future. And books also have the ability to adapt to that new media. In fact, audiobooks are very popular, and you can read books on digital devices. Oh, yeah. Books are incredibly malleable. I mean, audiobooks are very popular. In fact, they, they're, they're, taking, uh, they're um, selling better than e-books now these days. Audiobooks are very uh, popular. Um, and... Um, you know, far from the internet killing books, I mean, now there are thousands of book podcasts on the internet. There are lots of book-oriented sites on the internet. There's, I mean, TikTok, one of the biggest uh, social media platforms, has a whole area called Book Talk. And if you write romance fiction or thrillers, uh, Book Talk can be a uh, major um, uh, promotional opportunity for you. It's not for books like mine, but... Um, but if you write romance fiction or mystery thrillers, um, it certainly can. And so books have adapted to all new media and nothing has ever killed books. Americans still buy almost a billion books a year. And that doesn't even count the ones they take out of libraries. One of the interesting points in the book that I just didn't know about. So it was fascinating to me because, you know, we're used to paperbacks and that sort of thing. But there was a time when the whole idea of a paperback was brand new. And you talk about that in the book. Oh, yeah. When we say book, uh, traditionally in the uh, 19, from, from the early days into the 1950s, a book was a hardcover, either leather bound object or a uh, bound in um, uh, cloth covered cardboard with a dust jacket. It was a hardback book. And there were soft cover books that were super cheap and they were made out of very coarse paper that was made out of wood pulp. And they became known as pulp fiction. And pulp fiction um, sold in huge numbers, but it was uh, sort of underground. It, was, it didn't sell in bookstores. It sold on... Um, at magazine stands and candy stores, um, bookshops only sold hardcover books until 1953, when a man named Jason Epstein, who was an editorial assistant at a major publisher in New York, approached a leading bookstore saying, hey, supposing, supposing I printed books in a large format, just like hardcovers, with big type, just like hardcovers, on quality paper, just like hardcovers, but I put a paper cover on it. Would you be interested in that? And they said, hmm, that sounds good. And he single-handedly invented the trade paperback, which appeared in 1953. And it, today it's impossible to imagine publishing without it. I mean, trade paperbacks now absolutely dominate print books. 
Uh, hard covers sell, I think it's about a third of books and trade paperbacks are about two thirds. And one guy, Jason Epstein, dreamed this up in the 1950s and no one ever else thought of it. And those, his paperbacks made it into bookstores and fueled the tremendous explosion of book sales in the 1960s to the baby boom generation who were starting to come of age, had money, had some money, and had no prejudice against paperback books and bought them like crazy. Where do you see the book industry going in the future? Well, it's a three-ring circus. I mean, um, clearly, uh, uh, print is going to survive. Eighty-five uh, percent of books are are read in print, and when you ask people why they read print, you say, "Well, it's it's, it's so much convenient, more convenient to read on your phone or a Kindle. Why do you lug around a heavy book?" And people generally say, "You know." At school or at work, I spend my whole day staring at a screen. When I go home and I want to relax and curl up with a book, I don't want to look at another screen. I want to hold a book in my hands. And so it looks like books are here to stay. And the big panic about how digital was going to destroy books, that's over. Um, the vast majority of books sell in print. But beyond that, other formats are available. Audiobooks, as I mentioned, are really coming on very strong and now sell better than ebooks. Ebooks are are with us, and um, and who knows what's going to be next. But uh, people like long form reading. People like to read books, and um, I don't think that's going to change. We've touched on a, a number of things so far during this interview, but as a whole, what do you say are the key concepts? that you hope readers will take from your book about the book industry? Well, one is that um, the book industry is ever-changing. There's, there's been a myth uh, during my lifetime that the book industry, compared to other industries, is hidebound and unchanging. And the reason for that myth is that books published in 2024 look exactly like books published in 1964. It's just that everything behind that look has changed. And so... Um, Publishing is actually quite dynamic, and it's always changing. And if you're a publisher or a bookseller and you don't change with it, there is a word for what happens to you, bankruptcy. So booksellers and publishers constantly have to adapt to a changing environment, and authors do too. Um, authors have to realize that they're not going to make a living writing books. And my advice to people is instead of uh, getting an MFA – you might consider an MBA to get a good job that pays well, pays well enough to support your habit of writing books, because books are going to probably cost you money, more money than they make you. Well, if you'd like to learn more, the book is The Untold Story of Books, A Writer's History of Book Publishing by Michael Castleman. Michael, thank you for talking with me today. Dan, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to purchase the untold story of books, I've placed a link for you in the description below. If you enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe and hit the like button. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered. And here are two more interviews you might find interesting.